Hi, welcome to Integrative Lawyers of the World, where we believe lawyers contribute to the healing of the world. We believe this because we know lawyers who are doing just this from all over the world. Hi, I'm your host, Carrie Raleigh, and our guest this episode is Peter Lustig from Australia. Pete is a collaborative practitioner, mediator, lawyer, and coach. In our conversation, he shares his journey from a head-kicking, adversarial, gun-for-hire to someone who takes a more human approach, who is interested in healing and peacemaking, who helps his clients understand why they are in conflict and to learn from the conflict in their lives, who holds space for his clients, and who has worked with many personal growth projects and groups, including the Mankind Project of Australia. On his website, he writes, when people get vulnerable and are deeply heard, solutions invariably walk in the door unannounced. So listen to our conversation. Deeply listen to it. Who knows, maybe some solutions will walk into your door today. If you enjoy this episode, please check out our other episodes at www.integrativelaw.com. Thanks for joining us today. You are um, a collaborative practitioner, mediator, lawyer, and coach. Those are... Some of the things that I am, yes. Those are some (laughs) of the things that you are. I liked how you corrected me and said, those are some of the things that we are because yeah, we're so, so caught up in labels and that just instantly took me out of the label. So I want to thank you for that. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I think you, 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 you mentioned that you were going to ask me how I transitioned from um, what I've said on my website, which is that once upon a time, I was a head kicking adversarial lawyer, uh, gun for hire, I think is what I wrote. Yeah. Um, to who and what I am now, which is um, at times the same, actually. I still have those capacities, but uh, more often than not, I'm, I now call myself a peacemaker and I'm looking for ways in which, uh, for, for conflicts which can be resolved and in the resolution can um, help to heal people, basically, and have them be more whole. And, and to me, that, that, that's sort of completely in alignment with um, what integrative law is all about, you know, healing the world, but you don't heal the world you know, just by saying, come on, world, get, get, get with it, Gaia. Um, we actually have to do it you know, one person at a time. And the best person, as Mr. Gandhi used to say, apparently, is to start with oneself because I have the best permission um, you know, to deal with myself rather than to, in fact, probably don't have permission at all to uh, ensure that other people grow. So the best way is to ensure my own personal growth. So w- when you ask about my pathway from being an adversarial head kicker towards being what I am now, which is more of a collaborative practitioner, uh, among other labels, uh, it's just really the, the, the story of my own personal growth as it would be for anyone. Can you take us through that a little bit? And Well, it took me 68 years to get here. How long have you got? We have time. (laughs) We have time. (laughs) (laughs) Well, a really significant part of it, I think, was was being a a professional bum uh, after I qualified as a lawyer and, and did a year of what we call articles here in Australia, a professional practice year and worked for about four years as an employee in a couple of practices. And, and I gave it all up and became a, a professional bum hitchhiking on sailing boats sort of halfway around the world and ended up eventually in apartheid South Africa where... Okay, I, we, need um, to, we need to stop and break <laughs> this through a little bit. <laughs> you have been um, a lawyer for four decades. Where was it in those four... At least yes. your website said about four decades, so... Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's right. Where in that four decade period did you uh, do your, was it your hitchhiking motorcycle journey? No, no. 
sailing boats. Sailing boats, not motorcycles. So, although I've got a motorbike as well, but sailing boats. I jumped on a boat. I jumped on a boat in Sydney, a Sydney Hobart yacht, uh, yacht, delivering it back to um, back to Perth via the south of you know sailing around the south of Australia, and then I ended up sailing a couple of other yachts up to the northwest of Australia. Uh, another one out to what's called the Montebello Islands, which were the site of British Comet Test in the 50s, and they had only been just been deregulated. And then another boat yet again um, through Cocos Island, which is an atoll, um, and then to Mauritius. And then I jumped ship, it was either that or kill the skipper or be killed by him. Uh, and, and, and I, I, I lived on another yacht and eventually we sailed to Ile de la Réunion, uh, a couple of days sail away from Mauritius and there we stayed for a couple of months and I learned to speak in French. And uh, Do you speak French? Nobody else spoke English. There were three Aussie blokes on this boat, myself and two others, and, and we would constantly be speaking French to each other because we were just so deep. Tony Robbins calls it deep immersion. Yes. You know, we were so deeply immersed immersed in, in everything French that we we were uh, I was thinking and dreaming in French eventually, which really? is just beautiful. That yeah. is beautiful. I'm horribly ungrammatical and, and I and I say everything with an Australian accent, but um I, I was getting away with making myself understood. You know, you what what I did was add things like eek on the end of something. You know, so if it was magnificent, it became magnifique. Oh, I see. <laughs> but anyway, it works. So, but anyway, uh, so, like so after that, after that, uh, we, we sailed for Durban in Cape uh, in South Africa, and um, with a cyclone heading towards the island, and we were heading away from the island, and um, yeah, that was that was lots of fun. And then I ended up in South Africa for a couple of years, and um, in Durban, um, I ended up teaming up with an, a, an American sailor and she and I put together a project that was um, supported by the then, it's a citywide city council in Durban or as they all, all the cities are in South Africa. It was in the early 80s during apartheid still and uh, they had a thing called the Durban Arts Festival and um, Donna and I uh, used new games technology to get people into parks to have fun. They had fantastic facilities in parks all over Durban and not so many people used them. So um, we, we visited the director of Parks, Recreation and Beaches and he said, yes, he'd support a program of Life in the Park. And, and that's what it became, Life in the Park. And I spent months um, uh, getting companies in Durban uh, to put their logos on a big earth ball, a big you know, a earth ball, two metres in diameter, painted to look like the globe. And it's a beautiful metaphor because you toss an earth ball out in a park and there's always people who want to push the earth one way or, or the other. Uh, and I still have a vision of this big two metre ball trundling along the ground in a park with people racing after it and towards a, a, perhaps a group of people who were facing away from it and unsuspecting, and they'd go down like nine pins or ten pins. <laughs> this game sounds fascinating and the whole process of it. Yeah, it was social activism in the, in the, in the apartheid 80s. It was basically designed to get people together. To, to, apartheid worked so well because people were separate. So they, were, they were living separate. And contact between the races was very much about, um, in particular circumstances like customer shop assistant, um, you know, that sort of thing. These were activities and fun activities outside, but in bringing people together of the different races yeah. to be in it. Yeah. And as you know, you know, having fun is not a proper place for war. So if I go home and, and discover that, Wow, I had such a ball this afternoon and I was holding a, a white woman's hand or a black man's hand or an Indian boy's hand or whatever. Um, it was showing people that um, it was possible to have a whole heap of fun and that each other, each of us are human, actually. We're not just 
And the um, fear that you may have for the other side or for the other person or the other race, as soon as you have fun with someone and you play with them, th there is no room for fear. That's right. That's right. There's the, you know, in, in, indeed. Why did I hear that recently? Somebody said, um, it might, I think it was Rupert Spirit. He said something like, when people smile at each other, the there's a moment of our individualism, our, our isolation collapses. It's a moment of togetherness, of oneness. Okay, that is nice. Isn't that sweet? I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, which is part of Midwest. And everyone in Cleveland, you're, you're raised. When you see a stranger, you smile and you say hello. That's just how you are. And when I first went to university, everyone I see, I'm like, hi, you know, and I'm smiling. Hi, how are you? Hi, hi. And my friends from other cities are like, what are you doing? Do you know all these people? <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't know these people. And I thought, oh, I'm from Cleveland. That's what we do. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm warming to you even more now. <laughs> I want to go back to your like I want to go back to your adversarial gun for sure. higher phase but I want to make sure we come back to this because I am so um enamored by this oh sorry thank you my mom just brought me a nice tea well this will be one of those things we cut out uh oh okay so um, pity, I, pity I can't get one as well I know it is nice all right so I'm not sure why you cut it out of the recording because you know what it was doing was showing your you know an aspect of your humanity and and your mother's care for you. Yeah, that is but, nice. And isn't that what law is all about? In, in in you know in one way or another, it's about how it is that we go about caring for each other and for ourselves. All right, we'll keep it in. <laughs> that is nice. <laughs> just, 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 it's just it's true because if we do think of each other. Um, you know, it's kind of like the loving kindness meditations. You fill yourself up with love and then next you extend it to someone who you love or who loves you and then you can extend it onward and outward. Um, yeah. I was talking with well, a, a friend the yeah. other day, her and her husband, I think they've been married for 40 years. And she and I, we just talked last week and she and I hadn't talked in a long time, but we were on, on the phone for about 35 minutes. And she's like, Kara, I have to go. Her husband's coming home. And like, we've early on in our marriage, we've decided whenever the other person comes home, the one who is at home goes to the door and greets them. So I want to get ready so I can go greet him. And I'm like, oh, what sweet. a loving thing <laughs> to do, you know, just to have that. Oh, I know uh, what made me think of this is, and I mean, this may sound like, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm belittling that, that my friend and her husband, because I think it's absolutely beautiful, but it reminded me of when you come, if you have a dog, I don't know if you have dogs and you come home, they are so excited and so full of love to see you every time you come home. And if we treated people in our lives with that same love and, and enjoy that dogs give to us, I think it would be a uh, beautiful world out there. And that's the same like with my mom bringing me the iced tea, you know, it's an act of love. It's, I feel cared for as right now. So, all right. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Uh, and, and taking what you were saying a little bit further, uh, it's not just about loving those that we love. Uh, how, how, for example, can I find a way of, if not loving, in a literal sense, but but um, appreciating and perhaps being curious about and perhaps even caring for somebody who I, I detest. Who, I'm How sorry. That? Who I detest. Yes, who yes. Who I don't like. Or, or who triggers me or who I perceive and judge, you know, to be doing or being something that I find reprehensible. You know, what is it about that person that that I could see, you know, could love about them? Getting curious about that. Uh, some of the loving kindness or the meditations for a technique or a practice for to do that, that, that helps me is one sitting there, filling myself up with love for self-love first, then to a loved one. And then that, that feeling, that energy before, because it's, it's, if I would just sit down and think of someone who really hurt me and I'm like, oh, I'm going to extend love to that person, I might not be able to. But if I sit down and I think of the love from my mom and that 
energy fills me, then in that space, it helps me to think of going to like extending it to someone neutral and then that energy builds and then I can extend it to someone who's maybe hurt me or someone who just a difference of, you know, you just, how I think you just detest, it can help reset that detest or it helps when I do these exercises, it helps me reset that, that detest with uh, more of an unconditional well, what you're love. Doing, of course, is, is finding a place or a feeling or both inside of yourself, you know, where love lives uh, in that moment. And, you know, frankly, if somebody is, is annoying me, annoying the heck out of me or, having me have a reaction of, of, you know, I detest you or I don't like you or I hate you, that doesn't live in that person. That lives inside of me. Just as, you know, my life for somebody else doesn't live in them, it lives inside of me. I'm the one who's feeling it. So if somebody, if I'm hating somebody, I'm actually hurting myself because I'm experiencing hate somewhere inside here. Um, and so, you know, as, as, uh, one of your countrymen, Dmitry Bulgari, uh, who's something of a teacher of mine as well, uh, says, you know, when, when I'm triggered or activated by somebody else's behaviour, it's only signalling to me that there's some part of me to which I, can, I have yet to bring um, healing and love and compassion. Isn't that a beautiful way of looking at it? It is a beautiful way, and I'm pausing it uh, the reason why I'm pausing there is um, there uh, there are, as I look around my different experiences and things like that, there are a lot of opportunities for me or the opportunities or reminders where there's more room for growth or yeah. um, within myself. Yeah. So, so if I may bring it back, you, you were asking about, you know, how come I've gone from being a heat kicking litigator to being a collaborative practitioner Be, and, before and we bring... get to before we get to the how come you did the transition yeah. can we just because a lot of people myself included we start our legal practice in that mindset of being that adversarial hired gun um you know i think you in you're like um head kicking being like the the mightier the person uh, that's the energy that we have when we start the practice of law and that law school, at least for me, encouraged. So what was that like for you when you were practicing that way? I don't think I was ever completely that way. Um, I, I, I've, I was capable of doing those sorts of things and acting in that way. And I, my sense is I tempered it with doing so um, to further a, a, some sort of good. So earlier on in my career, I was often a, you know, what I would call a plaintiff's lawyer, somebody who'd been aggrieved in some way, um, and I would be being their warrior, fighting for, for right and justice and to you know, make things up in the world as they ought to have been, not as they in fact became for that person or that organisation. Um, when you had that mindset, though, or in, in the early days of practicing that way, yes, it's as a warrior for justice, but when you're dealing with opposing counsel in that mindset, um, even though it's like fighting for justice or fighting for right, yeah. how is that mindset in the process? Yeah, That's the point, that the system still calls it fighting, which indeed it is. So adversarial litigation, as I discovered eventually, um, sorts for difference. So we can have uh, we can have an argument about something or a conflict, and um, if we end up in an adversarial court, which is what all courts are, it seems, um, I'll be trying to say to the person in charge of the court, whatever they're called, a judge, magistrate, or, or whatever, um, that that I'm I'm right in what I've. You know, my, my story is right. My story is all good. And their story is, is evil and bad. And they're trying to do the, exactly the same at the same time or, or sequentially. Um, and, and so inevitably it pays me to differentiate myself from the other 
and, and vice versa. So we constantly become polarised. And the theory goes that, that if I'm busy trying to say this is the truth and they're busy trying to say, no, no, this is the truth, then the person in the middle can actually perceive what the truth in fact is, but that's not so. What we're doing is actually sorting for difference, polarising and getting further apart. And when we, when we are in court, we have mouthpieces saying it for us. So it's not as if I'm owning that stuff for myself. And it's a long and an expensive process and it, it completely ignores emotions. I mean, how often have you seen or been in court um, or, or seen in movies of court scenes, you know, where somebody gets really emotional and the judge says, oh, we, we better pause for a break here. You know, whereas in a collaboration, what we, what we, what we sought for is what have we got in common? Right? So in a family law collaboration, for example, where there are children involved, um, we might start a collaboration between the parents you know, who are separating with a question like, you know, what are your hopes, dreams and aspirations for your children? And, and inevitably, they're going to be saying something like, oh, wow, you know, I, I, I hope my ch our children are going to grow up strong and healthy and resilient and in some way or another are able to fully realise their potential as human beings. You know, you never, ever, ever have I ever heard a parent say, uh, and then we ask the other parent, you know, what are yours? And it will be very much aligned to that. And that's a touchstone that we can take them back to. So when, later when things get more difficult, in, 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 you know, in the separating and, and the discussion process, we can remind them that, hey, why are you here? You know, one of the, one of the reasons you're here is to perhaps model for yourselves, but maybe more importantly for your children, some sort of graceful and elegant resolution of difference, such as is going to help them to be those, those adults that you are hoping that they will aspire to and, and become. So when you identify so, so, the shared values that you have, yeah. then instead of fighting each other, it, it, it shift the energy so that, okay, how can we work together to get these shared value, to achieve these shared values? Or, yeah. Yeah. Or, or when it's clear that we have some differences to remind the, 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 the disputing people that, that actually, while there are some differences and clearly they might be quite significant, you still also have stuff in common, right? Whereas, whereas, whereas in, in adversarial litigation, what you have in common is that you're not the one speaking the lawyer is and you're paying through the nose for the privilege, you know, and you're both in pain, you know, even if you end up being a winner, so-called. So, 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 so I was also talking about emotions. So in, in a court, emotions are, are a shutdown. You know, as Margaret Picard, a, a fellow, a beautiful fellow collaborative practitioner here in Melbourne, talks about, um, she says um, um, courts courts are basically made uh, to deal with uh, legal issues, not emotional ones. And yet, Do every legal them. issue <laughs> is loaded with emotional, uh, totally. loaded and with emotions. Yeah, and especially family law stuff. Whereas, say, in a collaboration, I can see the uh, the other person's client sitting across the table or, or you know, if we're sitting in a, a nice circle, sitting in a circle across from me, and I can see, say, she might be shaking, for example. And I can notice that. And if, if, if I and my fellow professionals, you know, holding the space of the collaboration um, have helped to create a safe space for, for everyone there, then I can perhaps ask her, hey, I noticed that you're shaking. You know, would you speak to us? Would you tell us what's going on for you? And, and if she then does, I will hopefully have briefed up my, my own client to say, hey, you know, if she ever starts speaking about what's really going on for her inside, I want you to do some imago dialoguing with her. You know, the, the, the mirroring of what you're hearing, making sure that what you're mirroring is accurate, Asking is there more when there's no more eventually summarising it and making sure that that's landing and then uh, validating it, going the intellectual route and saying how it makes sense that she, she's been saying that, you know, picking the words that she's been using 
and again seeing that that lens and then empathising it, you know, saying that it, you know it, it, it makes sense in the feeling realm for you know again using the words that she's used as well. So by the time somebody has done that or even made a bit of a mush of it, but done something along those lines, that first person will feel really deeply hurt and, and solutions just walk in the door there because the, the charge of all of the angst that's going on has been discharged, if not completely, then significantly. And sometimes so, the how you're saying that person may feel deeply heard, sometimes yeah. that when you're feeling like you're not being heard, for me, when I feel like I'm not being heard, that's one of my triggers. And when I'm feeling that I'm being heard, that is that creates a safe space for me. Now that I'm feeling that I'm yeah. even if you disagree, but as long as I know that you heard me, then I feel valued yeah. and respected. That's a, it's a beautiful point, Kerry, because that my client doing all of that is not necessarily at all agreeing with what's been going on over there. It's simply saying, I've heard what you're saying. I've, I've been able to hold it in such a way that I could summarize, you know, what might be five or 10 minutes worth of speaking, you know, in perhaps a sentence or two that lands for you, right? And, and I get it intellectually and emotionally. That's not saying a word of I agree with you. That's saying I, I'm getting what, what you're, you, where you're at only. So, yeah, that's really, really important. And that really happens in a court. No, yeah, because going back to the adversarial system and um, when you were talking about it and you're saying how it polarizes, right? And it creates division, it creates more fighting. It, it absolutely does. And now when I look at uh, definitely out, even outside of the practice of law, but a lot of the media personalities in the US, some of them are former lawyers and they're adopting the adversarial system in the news media. Is it any yeah. surprise that we're getting increased polarization when you're having this adversarial model now into our journalism or media? Yeah. No. And politics. And Paul, yes. So wouldn't yeah. it be nice to have an integrative approach now totally. in, in our no. media, in our politics? Um, yeah. That's just, as you said that, it just made me think of that. And it was both uh, an aha, but also a sense of hope too, because just as lawyers in the legal profession have made this transition and this journey like you have, and I have, and people of the integrative law movement have that can expand to other professions other ways that we sure. deal with each well, other as humans I mean, it's, it's, only, it's only natural because as i become a more whole person less prone to behaving um out of my senses of lack or missing or not enoughness or unworthiness or to protect my my wounded places even if i'm doing it unconsciously the more conscious I become and the more healed I become, the more I actually have to give and the more I don't need to protect myself because there's nothing here to be protected and the more um, I, I can actually be out in the world as, you know, what I call myself now as a peacemaker and, and creating harmony and goodwill around the place rather than perhaps the opposite. You know, a beautiful, dear mentor and friend of mine you know, one of his touchstones, one of his major touchstones, in fact, if not the major, is to say, you know, am I bringing more harm into the world or good? But how come I came into this world? Uh, I'm busy working that one out still. But um, I imagine it's something along the lines of I'm here to learn some stuff. And, uh, and I think my sense is that most people are, if not all. Or, or I, I guess that some people are here to, to teach as well. Um, more so than, than to learn, but I think everyone ultimately is here to learn stuff so that their soul can be more complete than it might have otherwise been, but for this, you know, visit to this realm. And so that's what I'm doing. Sorry, sorry to get so existential on you, <laughs> but you did ask the question. <laughs> so you were getting to a point in your practice where, like, there's more 
for me to learn that's not in the law office, it's not in the courtrooms. There's more for me to learn in life. And I, I, I don't think it was so much about my practice. I think it was just about who I am and that I, I was so wounded and, and so um, capable and, and, and able and, and, and actually doing all sorts of horrible things in the world that um, you know, I wanted to learn from that. And, and a lot of that, of course, is in relationships. That's, you know, where the mirror is held up by whoever I'm with, you know, to who I am or who I'm not. <laughs> you know, whenever she triggers this in me, you know, it, it, it must live in me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be being triggered. Um, so, yeah, it's been a, a hell of a journey. And you know, the harm I've done over the years, I'm, I, you know, I'm... I'm uh, I'm not happy that that happened. You know, I could be really shamed, but if I was really shamed, then that would be to deny that it actually happened and, and, and to sort of call into myself. But Wait, can you explain that to me? Well, in, in the sense that shame, shame is sort of something of an immature emotion. It, it's sort of just saying, you know, in a way that Brene Brown talks about it, for example, you know, there's toxic shame, which is saying, not so much my behaviour was bad, but I am bad. Uh, and so often shame doesn't take responsibility for what's, what's taking place. So, so if I behave... So if you're yeah. standing in shame, it keeps you feeling bad about yourself, but it also stops you from really healing from it. Is that what you're saying? You're taking account or yeah, acknowledging you get it? To the, healing road, the, 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 the middle step is taking responsibility for what I've done. So if, if I've done something which I'm not happy about and indeed I'm, shame, I'm, I'm feeling shame about, um, the next step would be to take responsibility for that and, and to see what I can do to ameliorate it or, or mend it and ultimately to learn from it and then to forgive myself for having you know, behaved in that way. And the feeling comes out of that, of course. We are taking a brief break from this conversation to ask for your financial support. With each episode, we hope you can see how lawyers and peacemakers like you are contributing to the healing of the world. It takes many kinds of resources for the integrative law movement to keep going and affecting change. Your monetary donation can help us continue this important work by supporting the activities and the members of this community. Each contribution goes to promote the stability and accessibility of the movement and to support basic expenses like our Mighty Network Group, web hosting, social media and event management, and this Integrative Lawyers of the World podcast. Because we like to give people choices, we have ongoing monthly options to match your budget, or you can make a one-time donation. Thanks to our non-profit corporate sponsor, the Renaissance Law Society, US supporters are able to make tax-deductible donations. Supporters from other countries, please check your local tax laws. To help establish confidence in your choice to support us, we have set up an open collective transparent plan to track how the community money is spent. For ways to support the integrative law movement and our world-changing work, go to our website at www.integrativelaw.com and click on Support the Movement tab at the top of the page. Another great way to support us is to rate us five stars and comment, like, Follow or subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Google, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. These ratings and interactions help us get seen and heard by even more people to make an even stronger impact. Thank you for your support and spending time with us today. Enjoy the rest of this conversation. Why do you think it is? it can be difficult for people to step out of shame? Because it's comfortable. <laughs> it's a funny thing to say, but 
it, it's a little bit like you know the devil I know versus the devil I don't know. You know, if if I'm feeling horrible inside of shame, at least it's something I'm I'm familiar with and I know about it. And it might be even more frightening to, for example, drop my cloak of shame because I don't know what I would be if I wasn't that. Don't know what I would be if I wasn't that. Yeah. yeah. Read, read some David White on courage. <laughs> if you take the cloak off, like you said, it leaves you in a very vulnerable space. Yeah. Yeah. And if I'm really vulnerable, then, you know, would I continue to exist? And, and, and if I did, would I be existing in a way that, that I currently know myself? Well, the truth is that I probably won't. You know, in the next moment, if I've changed, then I won't know myself in the way that I used to. I'll be knowing myself in a different way. And, and that's and okay. Really, that's the whole point of conflict, isn't it? You know, conflict is the way that the, the universe, you know, visits situations and, and, and on us so that I, I can grow, I can move, I can change. I can take stuff on board and, and oh, gee, I really don't like that. Well, what I'll do is I'll smash it all up. No, that doesn't necessarily work. As a dear friend of mine says, um, you know, when I argue with reality, I only cause suffering first for myself and then for others. That is very true. Very, and, very and pointly not, put. And that's not to, to condone, you know, behaviour that might have impacted me, for example. But the first step in, in, in going past that is to say, okay, well, that's actually happened. So, you know, um, my car needed a new Ad Blue pump the other, you know, a couple of months ago. You know, I used diesel fuel and it has an Ad Blue additive that runs to it to, to make it more environmentally acceptable. And the pump um, stopped functioning and it cost thousands and thousands of dollars. So, you know, what I could have done is run around and screamed and yelled and pump the walls and, done all sorts of stuff, but, you know, because I didn't want to spend thousands of dollars on it. But, you know, what, what option did I have, you know, other than acceptance? How were you in the, like, were you in acceptance in the moment as it was happening and as you were dealing with it? Or was there a... There was, there was definitely a moment of, ah! Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> ah! And then I thought, oh, well, you know, I can't change that, you know. I did a bit of bargaining, you know, and got the price down a little. But, you know, after that, there was, you know, be it pay it or not. But, I mean, really, this is, this, is, this is trivial compared to being in a relationship, you know, where something really big comes up. So, um but it is also before you go into the relationship or maybe take it into the relationship is if you hold on to that, something like that could, if, you, if you're not in acceptance, something that could stay with you for the whole day and put you in a negative space for the whole day, which is going to affect what brain. you do what and who you are. Life? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well that's a little scary. <laughs> you know, like something happened in the child. I mean, all of us are formed by things that happened in our childhood to a very significant degree. Um, how many times have you met, uh, you know, the proverbial people pleaser in your life or in somebody else's life, somebody that you care about? And there's somebody who will go, go and do almost anything for somebody else to please them. What they're doing maybe, maybe is acting out from a, a, a lesson, a behavioural trait that they learnt as a young person, maybe probably a child, and it's usually to avoid pain or gain love or both. All right, and what I found is that if I throw a tantrum or I want this or I do that or, or the other, mum doesn't love me. So what I'll do is I'll attune to what is it that mum wants and whatever she wants, I'll do. That way I get her love or dad's love or whoever it might be. And what it does as well is it builds up resentment in me because I'm doing what they what, what I perceive they want and it might actually be what they want too. Right? And I'm doing it at a cost of, you know, what I might want to be doing for myself. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my sovereignty and 
that can build up resentment. And eventually it can build up so much, so much resentment that it comes out in an explosion of some kind, you know, whether that's a breaking in a relationship or, or something said or done or whatever. So, yeah. We went off on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> so you throw a tantrum, yeah. But and how you're showing how uh, conflict in our lives, you know, our our lessons or the universe conspiring to show us what we still can work on or grow or where we need to do. So um, yeah. I read a little bit about that on your website. And then as you were talking right now, it just reminded me of something. Um, so I'm staying at my parents' house right now and just for a little bit. And the other day, oh, and first of all, so backtrack this year, I, my goal for myself is to become more aligned, like aligned my, my actions, um, at, with my values, you know, instead of just saying, I, I, I meditate, actually do the meditation, do, do the calming activities, not just saying it, but feeling it, embodying it, being aligned. Right. So now fast forward, I'm at my parents' what, house. What I would say is aligning my head, my heart and my belly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. When, when, when they're all aligned, then, then I'm acting authentically. Yes. And that's what yeah. I've um, been wanting to do. Right. So I want to align all that. And uh, so, so now I'm fast forward at my parents' house. My mom and dad are, were sitting down at the table and I had an idea that I wanted to share with them. And I wanted to like workshop with it with them. And I'm all excited for it. And their initial response is... <laughs> My dad like, well, that's a stupid idea. Why? Or maybe he didn't say stupid. He's like, why in the world would I want to do that? And mm -hmm. my initial reaction was that of a 14, maybe 13 year old girl having a tantrum, temper tantrum, throwing down like my plate on the table or picking up my plate and walking to the trash can and like take the, uh, put the scraps in the trash can in like, but then like halfway through, I was like, huh maybe I was a little too attached to mom and dad really liking this idea and maybe mm -hmm. I don't need to be and it's okay but it yeah. took me um th that conflict shows that oh that conflict was there and a lesson that oh wait a second maybe I am still getting to it uh, still getting too attached to things and I and I get reactive and here's an opportunity for me to do it that's aligned in a way that I want to be now. Yeah, to, to, to notice yourself behaving that way. So your meta-awareness is tracking that. And next time that situation comes up again, you might actually remember that, uh, okay, I, I don't actually need to have them like this or I might get curious, for example, what, you know, why, why is he, he or she reacting in that way? You know, because I think this is a really good idea. Maybe I haven't explained myself in, in, or inspired them in the same way that I'm inspired with this. So what might I say or do that perhaps could produce a different result here? Yeah. And, and it's that capacity to catch myself between the moment of being triggered or activated by something in my environment, whether it's a person or whatever, and my acting on that just creating a little bit of psychic space. And how right, do you, can... how did you, or how do you create that space for yourself? Well, noticing it. <laughs> noticing it. <laughs> but, and noticing it as it's happening, I guess. Like, and not, like for yeah, me, I noticed I... it after the fact. Um... So you, you mentioned, for example, that you, you meditate, right? So the very, very first time or the first dozen times that you meditated, were, were you really amazing at it? Did you get to that space of, wow, I've just been somewhere, I don't know where I've been and I don't even know how long I've been there and, um, and I'm back here now, but where was I? Yeah? Yeah. So what, what you're saying is it took some practice. Yeah, same deal. So once, once, once you've made that, made yourself aware of that dichotomy the next time it happens you might not be and and maybe that night you'll be in bed and just before you go to sleep you'll, you'll go oh wow that was one of those i missed it and maybe the next time you'll you'll catch it 
And maybe the next time when you catch it, you'll catch it after having reacted. And you can say, hey, hey, Dad, I'm really sorry. You know, I've just reacted like that. You know, so I out myself, and that might help me to, to bring the lesson on board as well. A little bit more, a little bit more integrated. And and um, slowly, slowly, you'll you'll just be able to catch yourself more and more, you know. And and I, I assure you, um, I, I'm reactive at times as well, without thinking and without noticing. You know, I'm far from perfect. I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. That's that's part of the spice of being alive, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, if I was perfect, I'd be so fucking boring, wouldn't I? <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, am I allowed to use that word here? Sure, yes, we can. Because, <laughs> oh, you know, we all, we all wouldn't be here but for that. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> I was just watching something. I just love the timing of things. I was just watching something yesterday. I forget what it was, but the, the character, uh, the line of the character was, we're not perfect and it would be so, it would be, you're not perfect and that's okay because you would be so boring if you were perfect. And I can't remember the TV show that, but it was just last night that I heard that. So it's kind of neat that you're saying the same thing today. Um, so, yeah. that's, that's called a synchronicity. Yeah, I think. yeah. it's good. Yeah. I like those. All right, I'm, yeah, I'm, sort of... I've just Go noticed on. our time and I have so much more I want to talk to you about. Uh, do you have yeah. like an well, extra 20, 30 minutes? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to. So we talked about so the transition. So far, so far, I've been born. I've yeah. wondered why I come into this world. <laughs> All right, we've got another six, seven and a half years to catch up. <laughs> we'll do it in twenty minutes. Pretty, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, now I want so, to jump back ahead into, and then this will go on to your future stuff. But when you're in right. the journey in South Africa, and you came up with the idea for using play for social activism, how? Yeah. For people what are all time. the hows for that? Like, how did you, you explain the why for that? The why is so that people can develop, um, uh, develop their friendships, reduce the fear, or release the fear, and connect with each other as humans. Create community, if only temporarily. Yeah, and when create community. And having a good time with somebody, it's not a proper place for war or, 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 or division or, or the like. So it was, it was actually showing the humanity in people. New we used new games as a base technology. They were developed in, in San Francisco as part of the uh, anti-war movement in the 60s. How did you learn about this? How did you go from being the lawyer <laughs> well, into I this I literally found, found a book on new games in the Durban City Library. Really? <laughs> and we said, oh, wow, this is awesome. And, and we ended up, yeah, just I ended up moving around Durban to schools and different communities teaching games to people, including trust games and stuff like that. How did you learn those yourself? And then how did you get, um, did you we read the books invite and, yourself and, and, to the different groups or did you through? Well, we're, we're pretty public, which is one of, that, one of the things that protected us. We had a lot of publicity, but also a guy named Dale Affairs, who's again one of your countrymen. Uh, we heard was coming to South Africa and so we got in touch with him and we got him to run a games workshop and, and we went on from there. So yeah, and there's still there's still a New Games Foundation as well. New Games were actually started by um, Ken Kesey who wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and um, uh, what was his name? Uh, the guy, the editor of the Whole Earth Catalogue. Um, there was a, a thing called the Whole Earth Catalogue, which went into lots of public, lots of editions, and it was sort of a forerunner to, you know, Google, if you like, uh, in Google. And um, they they were asked by the San Franciscan chapter of the Anti-Vietnam War League or Draft Resistors League, you know, to put on a public event. And they decided that um, what they'd like to do is, is show up why it was that we all have an innate capacity for aggression and we needed to own it. You know, you and I were talking about shadows before we started recording. So um, what they did is they invented a game and it was played on roughly a basketball sized court, you know, on grass with a tire at each end and two medicine balls. And the deal was that 
the, the basic rules of new games are play hard, play fair, nobody hurt. And everyone in this game was on their knees. And the deal was you get your medicine ball in their tire at that end and try and stop them from getting theirs into yours at your end. And for any number of players. And then they called it the most offensive name they could think of, which was Slaughter. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I played that in South. We we said we read about that, and we played it in South Africa. You know, and and I swear I've never been closer to so many people of different colours. You know, black, white, pink, brown, blue. You name it. You know, we tossed a couple of balls in, and I was part of it. And and like within instance, there were actually three piles of people about ten people high. Wow. It was amazing. But that was really amazing. But what they were really doing was saying that um, the Viet, the whole of the Vietnam War was an instance of a whole nation not owning its own capacity for aggression. And they were saying that to cure that or to do something about that, what's really needed is for us to first own you know, the, the capacity for aggression within each of us. Interesting. As we're talking about in the U.S., there's um, grappling with race issues at home, and some yep. proponents are, you know, this there's this critical race theory that started out in law school, and now it's led into a debate of how do we talk about race? How do we talk yep. about race? And some people don't. Uh, it's very triggering just to bring up the topic here in the U.S. And I think what well, you just said, it's important to at least acknowledge the capacity of of being racist, acknowledge the capacity that we were in the past. Um, yeah. Well, that, that was the whole thing of um, just, uh, uh, you know, the, the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu, his Truth and Reconciliation Commission post-apartheid in South Africa is actually speaking what's been going on. Um, you know, so firstly to speak it so that it's not been hidden and and when people hear what went on, there's a capacity for um, first accepting it and then being able to let, let it go, but also to learn from it. Um, Bringing it out from the, the shadow. As, yeah, the same as, um, you know, the Shoah Foundation set up by Steven Spielberg following um, uh, Schindler's List, you know, to... to video document the stories of Holocaust survivors. Or here in Victoria, you know, where, where this land was colonised, um, you know, and, and decimated civilization, you know, 200 or more Indigenous nations here um, who had been surviving somehow or other, um, despite being quite uncivilised, you know, to 60 to perhaps 100,000 years or more. Um, so we're having in, here in Victoria uh, the Uruk Commission, which is essentially a truth-telling commission, and, and hearing the stories of the massacres and, and the mistreatments of people. So it is a beginning of a way towards healing. Is there um, any backlash the to that? Probably. Within there, I'm yeah. I'm not aware of it, but um, yeah. I was just wondering if there was similarities to what we're dealing with in our country here is when people, when some people say, look, we want to talk about it, we want to address it. There's other yeah. people saying it, it happened in the past, we don't need to. And uh, Well, my personal, my personal view is that to move onwards, I need to acknowledge what's going on in the past. If I've, if I've either behaved in a way which has caused harm or I've been a victim of harm, either way, if I'm ignoring it, I'm just I'm just creating a bar- an internal barrier, and at some point that barrier is going to go. You know, even if it's on my deathbed. Like you said before, if we're living it in, if we're keeping it in the shadows, if we're living in the shame, if we're not moving forward for anyone. Yeah. For ourselves. Uh, okay. I also want to talk about. Here we go. I was, I was, I was looking for a poem. I found it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You're looking for a what? A poem. Oh, yes. Please share. So it's reputedly by uh, Lao Tzu, who lived in China in the 6th century BC. And it 
I'm going to read it. I don't know it by heart, sadly. Um, if there is to be peace in the world, the nations must live in peace. If there is to be peace among the nations, the cities must not rise up against each other. If there is to be peace in the cities, neighbours must understand each other. If there is to be peace among neighbours, there must be harmony in the home. And if there is to be peace in the home, we must each find our own heart. I'm smiling. I, um, in 2016, I started my own little journey, a uh, smaller scale than yours, but before doing it, I made a vision board for the journey. And on the vision board, I wrote down a, a that it, variation of that pretty much follows that, but I don't think the translation that I got wasn't like word for word. But, um, yeah. but I, so it's something that I read a few years ago. I'm like, I want this to be a part of my life. I want it to be part of my journey. So it's smack dab in the center of my vision board. It's one of my favorite um, yeah. things. It just encapsulates when you said we're here for learning and the how and the why we're all here in this thing called life, that, that just, mm -hmm right there sets it to me so, so with thank you that's that's beautiful and, and on that note can i take you to one of my current projects yeah yes yeah, please do Will. oh goody the conscious wills okay because well um you know about conscious contracts yeah so, so conscious contracts are where you know you and i are going to go into some sort of commercial agreement and what we do is a V&V &V process to begin with. So visioning, mission, values. And what values in particular do we have in common? All right? And then we, we bring those that v and, those V&V &V results into our commercial agreement as a prelude to it, you know, which actually sets the tone or gives a context for that agreement. Um, and of course, we also have um, an ACED, an addressing change and engaging disagreement part of our agreement, which essentially is saying, because we're human, at some point we will be in conflict. It's not if we will be, but rather when. And it might just be a low level disagreement. It could be all sorts of things, you know, all the way through to a, you know, a, a busting apart situation. And what we do is we find the, the values that we've worked on earlier on that we have in common. What are the most important ones of those? And we bring those into our, our ACED or conflict resolution process. So in what way will those values guide us in taking on the process of resolution that we are designing for our, you know, that's going to suit us? Um, so in a similar way, um, Literally, there are literally thousands of wills contested in, in, in each jurisdiction in Australia every year. And um, it seems to me that a will maker um, often has some ideas of what they would like to do, but not necessarily in the context of what's their vision for the generations that are to follow. And um, what values do, you know, would they like to pass on? And of course, you know, their mission is you know, how that vision can be translated into action by, by means of setting up a will. So if, if we were to do a v, &V process with a will maker right at the outset, and then tentatively have a, a, a draft of the will or, or at least a, a skeleton of it, and then bring together all of the beneficiaries or potential beneficiaries and if again, as with a, in a collaboration, um, a, a really safe space is created, yeah. and we put forward this: this is what the will maker is interested in saying uh, and, and, and leaving, and the, these are the this is the vision that they have, and this is the values that are underlying that vision. Um, how does that how does that feel to everyone? And uh, as with in you know, the deep democracy movement, you know, part of process work. Um, when and if all the voices in the field have been heard, there can be moments of really embodied um, consensus. So it would then be the job of the facilitator of this process, such as myself, to ensure that everybody who's at the table or sitting in the circle gets to actually speak. 
and to speak to, you know, how does that proposal land with them? And so the rulemaker gets to hear what's really going on during their lifetime. You know, whereas you know, post-death probate litigation, they never get to have a say, or at least not in this realm. And so they can then talk about, you know, what could what could it, what could we do to take this on board and, and 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 have your concerns be addressed in a way which which has you and, and I all being okay with it, along with the other beneficiaries. So it probably takes a fair bit of courage to step into this, although not necessarily all of it on the part of the rule maker, because that's partly the, you know, very much the job of the facilitator holding space. Um, however, it, it, it's a huge advantage because uh, at the end of the day, the rule maker is the one who, who gets to hear what's going on and to be a participant in the results rather than um, but basically being a victim of whatever the result is in court you know, well after their death, where they can't really have a say in it at all. But also, uh, uh, the process also would require all of the beneficiaries to, to all of the participants actually, not just beneficiaries, to sign off on that to say they've been part of this process and, and, and um, failing there being some, some um, huge event you know, between uh, the, the date that they're signing and the death of the will maker, which changes the thing drastically, you know, they commit to not challenging it because they've been in this process and this discussion. I think that is an amazing project uh on on a couple different levels on the one level of when the beneficiaries are hearing it after the fact so in addition to letting the beneficiaries concerns being heard by the will maker uh yeah. but it also yeah. increases the it, it removes confusion you know what i mean if if the beneficiaries are there they're yeah. less likely to fight and, and they're talking and they're seeing it and they're observing it. And it's in a space where no one feels co coerced and everyone feels safe. They're less likely to say that's not what mom or dad wanted, you know, and they're less likely yeah. to fight with each other about it later on, which then helps mom mm -hmm. and dad's wishes to actually be carried through because everyone's a proponent of it now because they're part of yeah. creating but, uh, it. That is actually echoed down through the next generations, through their descendants, absolutely. And, and, and that's a way of bringing more harmony and peace into the world as well. Uh, you hear stories where families' estates are squandered through litigation yeah. costs and fees uh, contesting wills as opposed to just and, and their their you know brothers and sisters are fighting for years against each other yeah and it just seems silly and, and what's the fighting really about you know money, money might be you know the, the measure of it but often it's it's stuff below that so in, in a facilitated process where uh truth speaking is encouraged and, and you know where, where the, the space that's held is held in a really safe way and it's okay to speak what's really going on for you even if it might be hurtful to others at least initially you know it's better to have that stuff out and to then be able to deal with it than to not have it out at all or, or because it's still present you know even if it's not being expressed uh, consciously it'll be first otherwise you know in, in, in Strange relations or um, the, the way people get on or, or perhaps more, more correctly don't get on or, or don't get on as well as they might. Have you had a situation yet where I, where I think where it's probably the most needed but probably the most sensitive and maybe the participants might be the most reluctant to participate is when there's perhaps a black sheep of the family or a... Um, um, the there's you know four kids and three of them are getting equal shares but the fourth one is getting a little bit because of a fight yeah. that they got in with the parent um, yeah 
So what it does is it actually gives that fourth child an opportunity to, to mend things. In fact, it's not just it's it's sorry, it's not just that one one child because it's a family system. And you know, often one 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 or more of, of the of siblings might be put into a situation, not just because of who they are or what they've done or said, but also what the others are. All right. So so the system tends to balance itself. So somebody who's say a truth speaker in a family of origin, you know, can can to some extent be ostracized or or, or you know shunned a little bit. You know, oh, he or he, she always rocks the boat, right? And that's 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 them speaking their truth and being who they are. And it's the others that are saying, no, we prefer to be conservative and we'll, we'll swallow our tongues and not say stuff necessarily, mm -hmm. right? And both of both of are serving the whole. So it actually gives an opportunity for some of those things to come out um, consciously. And to be addressed, right? And that's where the skills of the facilitator come in, because um, I imagine that a, a will maker might, while they might want to heal rifts perceived or otherwise in the family, um, they probably would have done so long, long ago if they thought that they were capable of doing it. And so, in a way, the conscious wills process actually gives them an opportunity to address that sort of stuff. In, in, in a beautiful and healthy way. You had mentioned a few times having a, the concept of holding space and in conscious wills, you're like the facilitator holding space. Can you uh, yeah. explain a little bit what you mean by holding space? I hope so. <laughs> it's, it's where, uh, I guess, I or some other person is facilitating a process with one or more other people. And there's a, a, a deliberate intent around what it is that we're doing, why are we here? And, and very often it will include some form of ritual, like it, sitting in a men's circle, we might smudge people into the circle with a sage stick beforehand, for example. Um, we might do a check-in, you know, what's my name? What's my spirit name? Um, what am I feeling at the moment? You know, stuff from the neck down uh, and where in my body is it? Um, just to become more present. There might be a poem read, like, you know, like I did before or something that will help people to become more and more present. But ultimately, holding space is around what are we here for and how can I help you to be more present to, to that purpose that we're here about. And that might mean um, speaking some agreements and, and, and speaking proposed agreements and then having people present agree to those things. So, you know, no, you know the, the typical thing that you, you'd have at the start of a mediation, like, you know, please speak respectfully and, and, and don't be aggressive either in action or, or in your words. Um, you know, do some really deep listening. You know, wait till people have finished speaking before you jump in. A few things like that, yeah. And it can go a lot further. It can go way further. So in men's circles uh, that I sit in, you know, we, we have agreements around confidentiality, for example. A story that I speak is my story and no, no other man is at liberty to speak it outside of the circle unless I, they get my express permission. Right, but the thoughts that my story might give rise to in another man, or the feelings that that my story might give rise to in another man, are his to deal with as he as he wishes. So, um, holding space is very much about creating um, what what I call a container, or what is called a container, and and that's about creating safety. Uh, making sure that people are really present, which also, of course, addresses safety as well, and having them quite possibly using ritual to have them focused and addressed on why it is that they're there. And, and then and I, I guess then, and then once you get into the doing the purpose, like in the discussion around um, a will, it would be 
making sure that people don't interrupt others, for example, and, and you know, when that happens, asking respectfully and gracefully, you know, people to allow this person to finish. And can you please hold that that thought? And may, maybe even helping them to hold that thought. You know, to that, I'll remind you about it when this person's finished speaking. Um, all, all sorts of things like that to, to make sure that um, whoever is speaking has a chance to finish and not just finish speaking, but they might need to stop speaking and take a moment or, or maybe a few moments to check internally to see if there's something more that needs to be said. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. And, and then making sure that all the voices are heard as well. Yeah, so it yeah. seems like holding the space is, if, especially if it's in with in a group setting or for individual, making sure everyone's um, coming together in this space, having a clear sense of an agreement of how we want this space to be, the intention for the space, and then keeping the energy to serve that intention and the safe space for everyone involved. Yeah, which, which thank you for that reminder. It might mean, for example, saying after a period of time, let's have a bio break. Yeah, everyone might need a cup of tea or a drink of water or to you know, empty their bladder or you know, go, let's have a five minute break and walk around. Or it might just be, what about if everyone stands up and, and, and shuffles around? You know, walk across the circle and find a different chair to sit in, changing the energy up a moving it around. Yeah. It, 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 in a way, it's almost the antithesis of what happens in courts, you know, where courts are the, the amazing autocracies, you know, where the judge says, sit and shut up. <laughs> they might say, you know, more politely, but, you know, they're in charge and, and, and everyone is there at their beck and call effectively. And, and of course, part of the skill of good counsel is to to bend the judge to their to their beck and call, yeah. uh, with it, without doing it too obviously. Um, on the one hand, but the skill in holding space is to be inclusive and allowing, and to encourage everyone else to be that, rather than to be democratic. Being inclusive and allowing—that's a beautiful yeah. way of explaining that. And I could see how that serves an important role, and how it furthers with your conscious wills and. Just how you're going back to Lao Tzu's uh, poem, you know, starting with the individual and then healing. You are with the conscious wills. I can see it being very, you know, wills and death. The idea, no one, I mean, maybe it's a very, death is a very scary, uncomfortable topic for most people. And so now yeah. if you're creating this conscious will space in it and you're bringing other people in on it, one, I, I just see it healing at so many levels. It's it's not yeah. now a lonely process that someone has to do by themselves with their lawyer. You can bring in the family together. You can heal the family together there. And then the, the Absolutely. will maker's legacy is more likely and values to be carried over because everyone, the inclusiveness and the allowingness, what a beautiful concept. I love it. And, and you've possibly heard of Stephen Jenkinson, uh, a, a fellow North American, a Canadian actually. And, and he um, he wrote an amazing book called Die Wise, and um, uh, he talked about most most Western culture being death phobic, yeah, which we are. Um, and instead, I mean, one of my signature boxes has got a saying from him that's something like, um, uh, "Being able to see my own death is the beginning of my capacity to love my life." And ultimately, I guess, you know, what I'd like to do, how I'd like to die is, is by an act of love. Yeah, yeah. For, for my death to be um, an expression of how I can most love myself in the world you know, by departing, departing at, at least in this form. Yeah. That is a beautiful concept. It does make it a little less scary, <laughs> a little, you know, thinking of it as that way. Um, and that book was called Die Wise. Yeah. Stephen Jenkinson. Yeah. All right. 
I also wanted to talk about your men's work. We had uh, Dr. Amal Adal as a guest as well. So he talked a little bit about men's work. Um, yeah, I'd love to. Why don't we do it another time? Okay, because I'm just, <laughs> let me get this one <laughs> last question in. Um, sure. We ask this of every guest. So um, what does being an integrative lawyer or what does integrative law mean to you? Oh, wow. <laughs> I, well, that's a, yeah. Um, I guess it, it's an opportunity for me to express my, my humanity. You know, being in service both to myself and the, and the planet and humanity in particular, but the planet generally as well, uh, because you know, I care about our environment. If, if, if I don't and everyone else doesn't, we will for sure be headed towards disaster. Um, yeah, so yeah, being integrative, being an integrative lawyer is simply saying that I, I deeply value my and your humanity and the, the, the treeness of the trees and the, and the grassness of the grass <laughs> and all the, and, and the rockness of rocks and, and everything in and around me uh, in such a way that, um, you know, where I'm bringing my capacities to be a lawyer to the fore, I guess. Yeah. It's beautiful, a uh, beautiful expression of it. Um, so as I said at the beginning, uh, and I'll share, we'll share more information about, we'll share your website with our show notes so people can learn more about you and your work. It said you have the many hats that you wear, collaborative practitioner, mediator, lawyer, and coach. You do work with the uh, Men's Work uh, Project. Sailor. Sailor. Yeah, um, Sailor. You know, I think I've just, I've just acquired a, a country property as well. So and I'm selling up in the city. So. I think I'm about to become a person on the country, as we say it in this, in this place. Yeah. Kim had um, mentioned that a little bit to me about uh, your country place and how you might be planning like retreats there or have it be a retreat place. Yeah, to be on country, to, to have my food on Mother Earth and, um, you know, feel what she, she's asking for, not just what I'm calling for. Yeah. To be in tune with what Mother Earth is asking for, not just what you're calling for. Nice. Mm. Did you read um, Thich Nhat Han? Thich Nhat Han, I'm saying his name, wrote a book. Um, was it even called Mother Earth? But it was or letters to Mother Earth, and oh, wow. it was no, different things. Thank you. That sounds like an interesting read. It, it's a, yeah. it is. It really is. He always has such a great way of expressing himself. I think. So the indigenous people in this country that are sort of very much about uh, their cosmology is about being connected to country, and they're saying they're a part of that rather than um, they they say effectively that they're custodians of land and they have duties and responsibilities towards it, just as it, it provides for them, they need to provide for it. And so in a very real way, I think that's probably even a better answer to your question, what's integrative law? Integrative law is bringing more harmony into this realm, full stop. You know, law is a, 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 a lubricants of, of relationships. So we're in a unique position to bring that harmony in, perhaps more so than many other professions. There it is, yeah. like you said, full stop. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about before we go? Uh, probably heaps of things. I can't think of them right now. <laughs> I well, I do want to encourage people to uh, look you up on your website because there's so much more information that we were able to discuss today. But thank you so much for joining us. It was so nice meeting you. And likewise, and thank you, Kerry. And uh, I look forward to another opportunity when I, I'll, I'll have thought of what else I would like to speak about <laughs> apart from the many surveys. <laughs> I will. Um, well, thank yeah. you again.